Hi, I'm Matt Payne, and welcome to 20th Century Revolutions. Episode 1.4, Victory in the Peloponnese, The Greek Revolution, Part 2. Last time, we left off with the somewhat disastrous first attempt at Greek independence, when the Fleeki at Tyria's leader, Alexandros Ypsilantis, was soundly beaten back by Ottoman forces by the summer of 1821, just a few months after his expedition had begun. If it had succeeded, the Atyria's plan was for Ypsilantis' forces to eventually reach the Greek mainland, working their way down into the Greek peninsula, known today as the Peloponnese. However, when it quickly became apparent to Ypsilantis that his expedition was not exactly going according to plan, he decided to send his younger brother, Demetrios Ypsilantis, on an undercover journey to the Greek heartland. So, Demetrios left in March 1821, and after an at times perilous undercover journey disguised as a servant, the younger Ypsilantis would eventually reach the Peloponnese in June, around the time when his older brother was abandoning his troops and running away to Austria. By the time Demetrios reached the Peloponnese, nearly the entire peninsula was already controlled by Greek revolutionary forces. And even though many would welcome the arrival of this noble Phanariot prince, as he tried to establish his leadership over the region, the situation would prove well out of Demetrios's control. So, today we will try to understand just how a ragtag group of Greek revolutionary fighters took the Peloponnese within just a week of fighting, when the area had been under Ottoman control for hundreds of years, pretty much since the fall of Constantinople. For some background to start off with, the Peloponnese is the large peninsula that makes up much of southern Greece, and you can find a map of the area at 20thCenturyRevolutions.com. As with many Ottoman provinces, the peninsula was never quite fully conquered, and there would be, off and on throughout the years, occasional and at times substantial resistance to Ottoman rule. This resistance came from both local Greek Christians as well as rebellious Muslim regional governors. Due to the relative instability of the region, there were many people under arms who would fight for or against regional power brokers. Many of these irregular soldiers would often switch their loyalties as they saw fit, one day acting as troublesome brigands attacking Turkish or Greek notables, and on another day fighting on behalf of those very same authorities they had just been attacking. These men under arms would be called by a couple of different names depending on their ever-changing roles, and they would become extremely important in the quick success of independence in this region. The first of these men under arms are the clefts. The clefts were essentially highway robbers. Cleft literally just means a thief, and the root of the word is the same as kleptomania. The origin of the clefts dates all the way back to the original Ottoman conquest of the region in the 15th century, when armed chieftains fled into the mountains to avoid being killed by or conscripted into the Ottoman military. The clefts were primarily made up of Greek Orthodox Christians, but also included many Albanians. The clefts would carry on a near-continuous irregular war against the different Ottoman officials coming in and out of power. As you might expect, the clefts throughout the years attracted many unsavory characters fleeing the reprisals of Ottoman officials for having unpaid debts or for committing just other petty crimes. Even so, the clefts represented a real force in the region, inspiring both awe and admiration amongst Greek townspeople 
due to their snubbing of Ottoman officials and just general disregard for cultural norms, as well as their amoral plundering of local farms and robbery of unsuspecting travelers. The most important cleft within our story, as he will soon become arguably the most powerful military leader in Greece, is a man named Theodoros Kolokotrones. The life of Kolokotrones is in many ways emblematic of the clefts more generally, as he was a man whose position within the Ottoman political world was ever-changing, often switching his loyalties as each situation saw fit. Over the years, Kolokotrones would operate as an armed robber, an irregular in the Ottoman military, and a militiaman offering protection for elite Greek families. Kolokotrones' father was himself a powerful cleftic leader who took part in a rebellion against the Ottomans in 1770. This rebellion, the Orlov Revolt as it was called, was actually initiated by Catherine the Great of Russia as part of a larger war against the Ottomans. Kolokotrones' father was killed during this conflict when Kolokotrones was still just a young boy. Kalakatronis thereafter witnessed the brutal reprisals that followed this revolt as widespread anti-Greek violence spread throughout the empire. The memory of the Orlov revolt weighed heavily on the minds of many Greeks as the War of Independence began 50 years later, as an inspiration of resistance, but also as a warning of the brutal consequences that would likely follow any insurrection. After his father's death, Kolokotrones was brought up by his uncle, who taught him the life of a cleftic warrior. With the outbreak of war between the Ottomans and the Russians in 1806, Kolokotrones followed his father's example and crossed the lines, joining up with the Russian navy. Kolokotrones was thereafter forced to flee his home in the Peloponnese, escaping to an island in the Greek Isles. While in exile, Kolokotrones would come in contact with the swirling revolutionary world of Napoleonic Europe, learning military strategy from a British general and absorbing French revolutionary ideals of liberalism and nationalism. Reflecting on this experience, Kolokotrones nicely summarized the impact of revolutionary France on other national struggles, saying, quote, According to my judgment, the French Revolution and the doings of Napoleon opened the eyes of the world. The nations knew nothing before, and the people thought that kings were gods upon the earth, and that they were bound to say that whatever they did was well done. Through this present change, it is more difficult to rule the people. And indeed, it was becoming more difficult to rule the people. This was a fact known all too well by the Ottoman Sultan, who was increasingly losing his grip on his fracturing empire. Knowing that the power of the Ottomans was weakening in the Peloponnese, and hearing rumors of an impending uprising, Kolokotrones would leave his exile and return home in 1821 to begin organizing a loose confederation of clefts, a process that would eventually precipitate his rise to military preeminence amongst the Greek revolutionaries. However, in the winter leading up to the revolution, it was not Greek rebels like Kolokotrones that the sultan was worried about, but instead an Albanian pasha who had been shrugging off the sultan's authority for over 30 years. Ali Pasha has already briefly been mentioned when we discuss the growing power of regional leaders in the Balkans, and how the Ottomans became increasingly unable to exert their authority over the pashas, or governors, of certain regions. As we saw, rebellious pashas played an important role in the Serbian Revolution. However, possibly the most well-known and most powerful of all these rebellious pashas was Ali Pasha, who would eventually control, with almost no central oversight, a massive amount of territory encompassing what is now mainland Greece, Albania, and Macedonia. Ali Pasha was born into a relatively powerful Albanian family who had at some point converted to Islam and whose ancestry, much like Kalakatrones, was filled with brigands and bandits who rose to power through a combination of 
the force of arms, and political maneuvering to become local chieftains. Ali Pasha would himself begin as a bandit, living in the mountains, always bedeviling the Ottoman authorities and gaining followers along the way. And as these things so often went, Ali was able to leverage his local power base as a brigand to finagle his way into an official position as a regional leader within the Ottoman system. Once in power, Ali Pasha revealed a certain genius for politics. Immediately upon gaining his position, Ali went through what would become an ever-recurring process of replacing all of the military and civil officials under him with leaders of Albanian bands who Ali knew would be loyal to him and him alone. Ali then went on to set up a series of protection rackets and began doling out favors and privileges, eventually establishing a wide patronage network and accruing a vast personal wealth. After solidifying his regional power base, Ali then secured in 1788 the official title of Pasha of Yanina. With the center of his power in the city of Yanina in northwestern Greece, Ali began to extend his tentacles in every direction, eventually gaining effective control over the entirety of modern Greece, Albania, and Macedonia. Ali did this through, firstly, marrying his sons off into important families, ensuring they would take control of the surrounding areas, and secondly, gaining the loyalty of other regional leaders who became known as simply Ali Pasha's men. At the height of his power, Ali ruled over what was a de facto autonomous modern state, conducting his own foreign policy, at one point he even made a secret alliance with Napoleon, and governing his territory with little oversight from the Ottoman leaders at the Sublime Port. Ali Pasha had a mixed reputation amongst the people he ruled, thought of as both an enlightened despot and as a bloody tyrant. This was due to the fact that he successfully checked the power of many armed brigands and clefs who had for so long roamed the countryside as highway robbers. This suppression of the armed robbers endeared him to many peasants, villagers, and elite families who welcomed the stability Ali Pasha ensured. Ali also built up the infrastructure of the region, building roads, schools, and other public works projects. And though Ali was a Muslim, he also respected the religious beliefs of Christians and even dealt with Christians somewhat as equals, an act highly unusual amongst Muslim Ottoman rulers. This respect for Christians was important for Ali's rise as he ruled over a territory that had a large Christian majority. There was a dark side to this enlightened despotism, however, as Ali also ruthlessly repressed his political enemies through surveillance, imprisonment, torture, and assassination. And fast forward to 1820, just a year before the revolution would break out. Ali was arguably at the height of his power, but then the Pasha made a misstep when he ordered the assassination of a political enemy, which was a normal enough occurrence for Ali. However, the assassination was meant to take place in Constantinople itself, and this was a major affront to the sovereignty of the Sultan. The sultan had at this point grown increasingly weary of Ali's unchecked power, and so he decided to use this incident to make a move against the pasha. This launched what was essentially a civil war between the sultan and Ali Pasha. The infighting between Ali and the sultan had a few effects that would prove to be important for the Greek Revolution. First and foremost, the sultan always had the suppression of Ali as his number one priority. This meant that as revolutionary activity began to rise in the Balkans in early 1821, specifically in Greece and the Danubian principalities, the sultan was either too distracted by Ali to give the resistance his full attention, or he thought that these revolts were actually just part of Ali Pasha's larger fight against him. And while rebellious activity on the part of the Greeks was not due to some secret conspiracy led by Ali Pasha, Ali, for his part, did
did very little to suppress the Greeks and would eventually begin to strike deals with the revolutionaries as their power grew. Early on, though, Ali primarily gave the Greeks breathing room, and this was partly the reason why the Feliki at Tyria were able to grow their numbers so rapidly right in the heart of the Ottoman Empire. So, the Etiria had had a lot of success recruiting in Ali's territory in northwestern Greece, as well as farther south in the Peloponnese. This meant that there were many Etirists in Greece who were actively anticipating the arrival of their leader, Alexandros Ypsilantis. Upon his arrival, these agents planned to help Ypsilantis launch his war of independence against the Ottomans. So this was the environment in Greece on the cusp of the revolution, with war raging between the Sultan and Ali Pasha, and a growing anticipation set off by the Etiria for the onset of a nationalistic struggle against the Ottomans. At the end of 1820 and beginning of 1821, Ottoman military garrisons in the Peloponnese began to empty as the imperial army was taken north to face Ali Pasha. This meant that the Muslim Turkish elites in southern Greece were left incredibly vulnerable in an area that was already a precarious place to be an Ottoman overlord. The Muslim population was dwarfed by Greek-speaking Christians at a ratio of 10 to 1, even though Muslims owned 60% of the land. With the departure of the imperial army, these Muslims were left essentially defenseless. The Peloponnese was also home to a class of Greek elites who were in a very different but similarly precarious position to the elite Muslims. These so-called Greek notables held an extraordinary amount of power within southern Greece, and at times they even rivaled the power of Muslim leaders. The Greek notables would become extremely important for the course of the revolution. However, they hold an interesting place within it. The Greek notables were made up of a few powerful Greek families who had been granted rights and privileges by the sultan over the years, rights and privileges that other Christians were not given. This arrangement meant that, in many ways, the Greek notables had more in common with local Muslim leaders than they did with the Greek peasantry. Indeed, the Greek notables were often derided as Turk lovers due to their deep ties with the Muslim elites. This class solidarity between Greek and Turkish elites was most visibly represented by the fact that the Greek notables exhibited the manners of Ottoman aristocrats, dressing in elite Turkish style rather than dressing as Greek peasants. This would change, though, as the revolution kicked off and began to find early success, with many Greek notables ever so slyly beginning to wear peasant garb to fit in with their Greek counterparts. The class antipathy between the Greek notables and the Greek peasants would, however, never go away. And this rivalrous relationship extended to the powerful clefs, whom the Greek notables looked down upon as nothing more than highway robbers, but whom they would nonetheless employ from time to time to ensure protection. This fractious relationship between the notables and the clefs would become important for Kolokotronis' rise to power specifically, as he had historic ties to certain elite families who offered the warlord protection upon his return to the Peloponnese, but who also expected deference from him in return. The Etiria were successful in recruiting across these class divides, and by late 1820, they had members amongst both the Kleftic leaders as well as the Greek notables. This was one of the most important successes of the Etiria, as it began to forge a nationalistic feeling amongst the Greeks, a feeling that had previously not really been present. An important figure in the growing influence of the Etiria in Greece was the bombastic and quick-tempered priest who went by the name of Papaflesas. Papaflesas arrived in the Peloponnese in late 1820, having been sent there by Ypsilantis and the Etiria to garner support for the impending revolution. Due to the characteristically horrible communication between the Etiria leadership and their agents in Greece, Papaflesas had not heard that Alexandros Ypsilantis had actually changed his plan 
to instead begin the revolt in the Danubian principalities. Therefore, Papa Flesas used his larger-than-life personality to gain support for the Etiria, promising that Ypsilantis would soon be arriving with an army, and, like all good Etirists, hinting that Russian support would not be far behind. In this way, Papa Flesas was one of the most outspoken advocates for an immediate uprising in the Peloponnese. In January of 1821, Papa Flesas had a secret meeting with a group of Greek notables to discuss plans for the revolt. The notables were largely unimpressed by this eccentric priest spinning fantastical stories of massive armies backed by the Russian Tsar, and one notable who knew of Papa Flesas even said, upon learning who had come to represent the Etiria, Papa Flesas, Popo, were done for. Nevertheless, they agreed to maintain secrecy and to stay ready for when Ypsilantis' fantasy army would arrive. The notables were only cautiously buying into these plans, though, and they reached out through their own channels to see if Russia and the other powers of Europe were really behind the attack. Ultimately, though, the beginning of the revolt would be out of the hands of these cautious notables. Papa Flesas and other Etiria agents had been spreading rumors of the impending revolt to such an extent that active preparation, such as collecting arms and starting up gunpowder mills, had begun in earnest amongst the Greek villagers. Then, in early 1821, the Etiria got a letter from Kapodistrias, who, you may remember, was the Russian diplomat of Greek origin who had been so important at the Congress of Vienna and who had refused the leadership of the Etiria. To the dismay of the Etirists, the letter from Kapodistrias explicitly said that plans should be put on pause and that no revolution would take place in the Peloponnese. This letter from Kapodistrias meant that the Russian army was definitely not coming. As these things so often go, though, the Atiris now felt that they had gone well past the point of no return. They knew that many bystanders had seen evidence of their active preparation, and it was pretty common for villagers to notify Ottoman officials of insurrectionary activity because they feared harsh Ottoman reprisals against the community as a whole, as had been seen after the Orlov revolt that Kolokotronis' father had taken part in 50 years earlier. The Etiria was right to fear as the Ottoman officials had already begun to receive tips and began to suspect that all was not well amongst the Greeks. When questioned, Greek leaders often blamed the rumors on Ali Pasha, and this usually assuaged suspicions temporarily. However, there were enough signs of revolutionary activity that certain Greek notables began to be summoned by Ottoman officials both in order to be questioned, but also in order to be held as quasi-hostages to be used as bargaining chips should the need arise. These signs of impending Ottoman repression led the Etiria to conclude that, if the hammer was about to come down on them anyways, you know, they might as well rise up and try to take on the Ottomans while they were still weak, with the majority of their forces away dealing with Ali Pasha. All of these developments led to a situation in which, by March of 1821, there was such an intense level of anticipation on both the part of the Greeks and the Turks that a violent confrontation became nearly inevitable. The interesting thing about the start of the Peloponnesian revolts, though, is that there was no clear leadership in place due to the fact that everyone had kind of been waiting for Ypsilantis to come riding in to smash the Ottomans with an imperial Russian army at his back. As we know, however, Ypsilantis was at this point hundreds of miles away getting trounced in the Danubian principalities, and he never really had any chance of making it to Greece proper. Due to the combination of widespread expectation of an impending revolt, paired with a complete lack of central leadership or a clear direction. The revolt would actually erupt in multiple locations, nearly simultaneously, and without any coordination whatsoever between the different uprisings. These scattered revolts would typically begin due to rumors spreading throughout a given village, 
the most common being the rumor of an impending Russian invasion. The Atiris, of course, did nothing to stop these rumors, and they just as often helped to spread them, with one instance in which an Atirist agent actually dressed up like a Russian general and then confirmed that the rumors of a Russian invasion were true. These rumors led Greeks to become emboldened, attacking Muslim leaders in different towns and villages throughout the region. Other Greeks, knowing what likely lay ahead, encouraged their Muslim neighbors to flee before the violence began. In other towns, violence began when Greek notables, who had been summoned by Ottoman authorities, became aware that they were in fact being held hostage. Now aware of their predicament, these notables secretly gave the go-ahead to local clefs with whom they had been conspiring over the preceding months. All of this led to an incredibly chaotic environment in which violence was sporadically breaking out across the Peloponnesian Peninsula, as Greek Christians were rising up, often as marauding mobs murdering prominent Muslims who had been left defenseless. In order to escape the violence, Muslims were fleeing and seeking shelter within the fortified towns and cities. The greatest number of Muslims fled to the city of Tripolitsa, the administrative capital of the region in what is today known as Tripoli. Within just a week of these sporadic violent uprisings, the Greeks had essentially taken control of the entire Peloponnese, with the exception of the highly fortified towns and the capital of Tripolitsa. The Greeks were able to so quickly take over the Peloponnesian countryside due to the fact that, number one, the Muslims were so massively outnumbered, number two, the Ottoman military garrison had been cleared out to face Ali Pasha, and number three, many of the Greek notables, who in the past tended to side with their Muslim counterparts in the ruling class, began to throw their lot in with the rising tide of rebellious Greek peasants and clefts. The process by which these Greek notables came over to the revolutionary camp varied significantly. However, it largely came down to the fact that it was becoming increasingly clear that broad repression against all Greek Christians was impending. This made it more advantageous for the notables to try to use their historic authority to take charge of the chaotic rebellion. If they did not join the uprising, it was a lose-lose, as they would face reprisals from both angry Greek commoners as well as the Ottoman authorities. The suspicions of the Greek notables would ultimately prove to be correct, as nearly the minute that news of the Greek uprising reached Constantinople, an organized massacre of Greek Christians ensued, not only in the capital but throughout the empire. These draconian measures created a zero-sum game that forced elite Greeks to throw their lot in with their social inferiors amongst the peasants and the cleftic war chiefs. The cross-class solidarity amongst the Greeks was not completely based in cynical self-preservation, though, as the Etiria really had succeeded in their efforts to forge bonds amongst the Greeks as a whole. Though, of course, they had also succeeded in convincing everyone that Russia would soon come to their aid, a false rumor that was largely responsible for the reckless abandon of the Greek rebels early on. A generalized euphoria quickly spread throughout the Peloponnese as the Greeks took town after town, and this rapid turn of events lent a quasi-religious fervor to the Greek effort, as many began to see their success as preordained. For many, many years, the Greeks had spoken of the so-called Romeiko, which was essentially a prophetic belief in the Christian reconquest of Byzantine lands that had been taken by the Ottoman Muslims. Due to the fact that the Greek Christians had been living under Ottoman rule for centuries, it is no wonder that they lent an aura of prophecy to events when they just sort of miraculously took the entire Peloponnese within just a week. To many, it seemed that the long-awaited Romeiko had finally come about. Now that they had taken the Peloponnese, however, the Greeks found themselves in an incredibly precarious situation. Greek forces controlled the vast majority of the Peloponnesian Peninsula, Yet, they had not yet taken the fortified towns, and most importantly, the capital of Tripolitsa was still in Ottoman hands. 
and the taking of the capital would require a more coordinated effort that had not yet been attempted by the disorganized Greek forces. This is where Kolokotronis really began to rise in importance, as he had, during the revolt, brought together a number of cleftic leaders into a loose confederation. Kolokotronis also had important ties to Greek notables, having served them in the past as an armed retainer. Because of these connections, Kolokotronis rose as the de facto leader of the operation to take Tripolitsa. The rebels had control of most of the territory around the city, so a siege of the city became a logical option. And so the siege of Tripolitsa began in April of 1821, and it would last for nearly six months. During the siege, important politicking would take place between the Greek leaders that would go on to have major ramifications after independence had been won. This maneuvering would at first center around the contentious arrival of the aforementioned Demetrios Ypsilantis, the younger brother of the Etiria's leader. When Demetrios finally arrived in the Peloponnese after his months-long journey from the Danubian Principality, where his brother was currently being defeated, the younger Ypsilantis pretty much expected to be welcomed as a prince. And indeed, this was his initial reception, due to the fact that he hailed from an illustrious Phanariot family, and because he directly represented the Atyria, who had been so influential in the months leading up to the uprising. It quickly became clear, however, that Ypsilantis envisioned himself as a kind of populist prince, as he hoped to garner the support of the common folk by putting a check on the power of the Greek notables. This, as you might expect, did not sit too well with said Greek notables, and they became ever more wary of this foreign aristocrat who thought he could just waltz in and declare himself a dictator, even though he had literally just stepped foot in the Peloponnese for the first time in his life. Had Ypsilantis the Younger been a more keen politician, he likely could have taken control of the situation because he did in fact have the support of the Greek commoners, and more importantly, he had the support of the rank-and-file Greek soldiers. This became evident when the notables prematurely sent Ypsilantis away during their initial meeting, and this dismissal nearly led to an insurrection against the notables in support of Ypsilantis, whom the common soldiers saw as their long-prophesied prince of the Romaico, who would do away not only with their Ottoman overlords, but their tyrannous Greek masters as well. Kolokotronis, once again revealing his essential position as a mediator between the notables and the armed rebels, stepped in to quell this insurrectionary activity. Ypsilantis was anything but a keen politician, though, and he would quickly be outmaneuvered. This occurred when Ypsilantis began to insist that a portion of the spoils from Tripolitsa should be held within a national treasury once the city had been taken. And while this policy might seem, I don't know, kind of smart, it brought not only the notables against him, but the cleftic warlords as well. Because everyone was largely in this for personal profit, and the rebels at this point only had like the vaguest aspirations for establishing a centralized government. So now that everyone could agree that they wanted to get rid of this foreigner who was trying to take their money... When it was heard that there was an Ottoman force coming to relieve the city, the notables and clefs encouraged Ypsilantis to go off and defend them. You know, your great princely presence is needed, uh, way over there. No, 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 we'll be fine here without you. And once Ypsilantis left the siege of Tripolitsa, he would never again be in a position to claim complete leadership over the revolutionary movement. Once Ypsilantis was gone, any sense of restraint amongst the soldiers left with him. Ypsilantis had been one of the few voices arguing for a humane capture of Tripolitsa, looking out for the lives of Muslim civilians, likely because he had not grown up in the Peloponnese and had not witnessed the anti-Greek pogroms and general repression that had defined the last 50 years of Ottoman rule there. The clefs, notables, and common soldiers did have this bloody history in mind, however, 
so that when the city did finally fall in September, a widespread massacre of the city's non-Christian inhabitants soon followed. Figures vary, but it is estimated that some 10,000 civilians, both Muslim and Jewish, were killed in the ensuing chaos. These killings wiped out nearly the entire non-Christian population of the city. The massacre at Tripolitsa was the final act in a more generalized extermination of the non-Christian population of the Peloponnese during this first stage of the revolution in 1821. And the massacre would open a rift amongst the emerging leadership of the revolution. When Ypsilantis finally returned to the city, he was appalled at the carnage, even though he also attempted to claim some of the city's loot for his army. But the Greeks had successfully taken the entire Peloponnese. However, they still did not have a clear direction or any real decisive leadership. Kolokotronis was undoubtedly the man of the hour, but he was more interested in revenge, looting, and growing his personal army. He did not really have any real desire to create what was actually needed more than anything else at this time a political administration and military hierarchy to coordinate what was clearly going to become an increasingly complex revolutionary war. The man who would take up that mantle was in fact not present at the siege of Tripolitsa at all, but was instead busy building a personal power base and introducing constitutional government in northwestern Greece. This was Alexandros Mavrokordatos, who would, in a short six months, help to create the first constitution of modern Greece and thereafter be elected as the president of the newly created First Hellenic Republic. <laughs> 